pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mrs. Mayor, if you do the roll call, please. I would be happy to. Kate Mayor, I am here. Lisa Collins. Here. Tim Mettiger. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Tom Cruise. Here. Jeff Young. Here. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Anita Zhekosinski. Yeah, she is excused. Thank you. So with six of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Um, approval of the, of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to local media. With this in mind, are there any changes? Seeing none, um, at this time, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. I would so move. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time period be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. And I don't see anyone coming forward, so then we will move on to recognition and thank you. Dr. Mueller. Well, first I wanna start with um, a former student of ours, Nathan, or Nathaniel Strauss. Um, he was a graduate um, a 2012 Holman graduate. Um, he has a very strong connection to the major news that came out of the physics world this past week. Um, what I'm referring to is this amazing announcement that gravitational waves have been measured for the first time and how this discovery finally supports one of the Einstein's claims about general relativity. Being a former physics teacher, I was very excited about this. <laughs> um, some are arguing that this, to date, the discovery of the 21st century um, Nathaniel has been working on the project for about three years as an undergraduate student at Carleton College. And his work on the project also included a few months of research at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics in, in Germany. Um, Nathaniel's scientific collaborators recognized his contributions by listing him as one of the many co-authors of the scientific publication describing this discovery. <coughs> so. He, if you recall, he was actually a National Merit Scholar in the valedictorian of the 2012 Holman High School graduating class. So it's exciting to see um, the success some of our past graduates are having. Um, then our Holman Youth Baseball Parents Association, they gave a generous donation of uh, $1,500 to support improvements at the Holman High School weight room. And that, so thanks for your commitment and dedication to sports in Holman. We definitely appreciate it. It is FFA Recognition Week, and we actually have Laura Munger here, and she is going to share a few words with us. Um, and you can go ahead and come on up, and we have a, you can talk in the microphone over here or there. Um, but while she's coming up, um, I had the pleasure of kicking off the week with them at a um, farmer share meal on, what night was that? Fr I, Saturday evening, I can't remember which evening I was though. And, um, it was really neat. They just did a kind of a trial run of this farmer share meal, and we got to have um, a, a meal with ham, potatoes, rolls. Oh my goodness, there was apple pie, custard. And what it was, it showed us what the farmer gets for each of these. So our meal was actually a dollar and 44 cents, you know, if we were to pay the farmer share part. So it was really a neat um, activity that we, we did that evening. But I will let you speak now, Laura. Thank you. No, it's not on. Is it? Well, we'll help you out here. Yeah, is it on now? Or? Not yet. <laughs> yeah, there. Oh, there. Oh. Your mouth. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. So, well, thank you for having me. I am your um, FFA vice president here this year. Um, and we did just have our farmer share meal, and that was a first time thing, and it turned out to be a really great experience. Uh, and today we are amplifying our chapter involvement uh, as FFA members, and we right now have uh, an FFA meeting going on, as well as our Ag Olympics. So we have different activities um, like chicken bowling, uh, pig balloons, uh, cake decorating, and 
um, the spaghetti towers. So that's kind of a fun way to kick off the week and get members excited for National FFA Week. Tomorrow we are um, kind of a showing appreciation towards our staff. So we will be wearing uh, official dress, like what I have on now, and we will be delivering cheese and sausage trays to the different um, buildings in the school district and just uh, showing how much we appreciate their support and their interest in our organization and everything we do. On Wednesday, we are showing our appreciation for the community members. So we will be waking up at 5.30 in the morning to bake fresh cinnamon rolls for the area farmers and delivering breakfast to them while they are busy producing food for us. Uh, we will also be uh, continuing throughout the whole week an emblem hunt. So we have a, an FFA emblem hidden around the school and we have different clues for each day. And then the winner at the, whoever finds the emblem will um, be given a prize. We, on Thursday, then, are, um, we have our showing our skills and our knowledge for FFA. So we will be, during all three lunches, Mr. King will be serving pie and ice cream to the FFA members and just kind of gathering as a chapter towards the end of the week. On Friday, then, we will be ending the FFA week with uh, Boots for Roots Day, where we wear clean work boots, not snow boots or fashion boots to the school uh, for the day. And then during the our all three lunches, we will be given rip your floats um, as kind of a wrap up for National FFA Week. Also, the last activity we will be uh, attending for Friday is going to the Cashin High School to have a meet and greet with our national president as they have chosen Wisconsin to be one of the states that he will attend for National FFA Week. So this is a great opportunity for us, and I just want to thank you again for showing an interest in our organization, and it really means a lot to us to have <coughs> the support of our district. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what, is your, uh, what is your role again? I am vice president. What is your first name? Laura. What's in the boxes? <laughs> oh, I have gifts for you guys. Oh, I was just nice going to tell you, 1007 Deerfield, you know, when you're doing the cinnamon rolls. That's <laughs> 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 no. no, we really do um, appreciate all that you do, and you bring a lot of recognition to Holman Schools. Um, the program has for many years, and this year is no different, and we really appreciate that recognition that you do. Cashton is my alma mater where I graduated from, so <laughs> I know that that's a, another great FFA um, program. So congratulations and enjoy the week. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions for us? Today's Washington. I just think you're so creative. I'm writing these things down. <laughs> Cheese and sausage trays. Ch chicken bowling? What, yeah. what is, <laughs> oh. Can I just um, ask what well, chicken bowling is? We have frozen whole birds of chicken and we wrap them in duct tape and I think they're a couple in years old tape. now yeah and we have bowling pins set up with bumpers of course this and we throw the frozen chicken down and knock the pins over how long has this been going on like how do how do I not know about this because I want to come <laughs> uh, it's been a few years it has yes and what's the date that you're doing this this is tonight. Oh, tonight you're yeah. rolling the chickens? Yep. It's probably going on right about now, too. Really? Just head over there. And <laughs> they didn't get going. Yeah. And then Pi and all of this. Who is, who is your sponsor in FFA? I always like to ask. Your advisor. Who is the the our advisor, um, Mr. Roger King. Yep, Mr. Roger King. We love him. Yep. Yes. And his son is actually the teacher at Cashton. At Cashton, yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Yes. Really? Yes, the tradition goes on. So, well, send send our love back to all the people that work with you. This is um, you can see how I'm smiling tonight. Um, and I know FFA. I think Lisa, aren't your kids involved in this? No. Also, no. with your chickens and such. What's <laughs> that? Is no. that a different it's thing? It's more of a 4-H. <laughs> oh, a 4-H. We'll get there. Soon. Okay, but they might grow up to be part of this when they're in high school. So um, thank you for what you're doing. Um, your leadership is just, I can see it in your face. So thank that's you. a really cool thing. <laughs>
Thank you. And it sounds like you're doing a lot to recognize others, but you should be recognized since it is your week. So congratulations for the week and enjoy. Thank you. You should get some media for the turkey bowl. <laughs> George chicken, Washington. Chicken. Chicken, chicken, chicken bowl. It's a chicken, it's not a turkey. Well, try turkeys too. But uh, George Washington was a huge capitalist. He was a great president. He would have used media for that. So that's something you should consider. We'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Definitely for next year. Yeah. All, right. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. And then um, also this next week, or actually in two weeks, the week of March 7th through the 11th is our National School Breakfast Week. So we will celebrate our supervisor, Mike Gasper, and his staff for their dedication to our students. Um, for more than 30 years, the school breakfast program has contributed to the health and educational development for our, um, our children in, in our district serving nutritional breakfast. So thank you we, we get to come to that, right? It seems like I've been to breakfasts on National Breakfast Week. Yeah, maybe. yeah. More to come. More than likely. More to come. More information to come. Excellent. Mr. Gasper's work because it's this. always so delicious. <laughs> okay. Any questions for Dr. Mueller on the district administrator's report? Oh. oh. Anything else? Thank you. I'm sorry. Did I cut you I off? I think we're good. Yep. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, I got my button the other night too. <laughs> thank you. We'll bless your heart. Okay. okay. Then the next item on our agenda is to visit with Representative Steve Doyle. So, Representative Doyle, if you want to take a seat over there, that would be great. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. You just Ooh, candy in there, good too. with your life. Oh. Small. Just kidding. Thank you. It's really nice. Thank you. Thank you. And then Representative Doyle, if you want to just start with, I think, a few opening comments. I think Dr. Mueller had communicated that, that we'd have you start with that. And then if there are any questions, um, we will have the board leave an open opportunity for them to do that. Sure, but let me start with a concern that you put me after, Laura. How do I follow chicken bowling? <laughs> I'm going to put you to sleep after that. Um, just a, a couple oh. uh, initial comments. One. Um, uh, there you go. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right, now I feel better. All right, thanks, Laura. Um, I was talking to Dr. Mueller when I came in, and her daughter, uh, who is an honor roll student, obviously, got a letter from me this weekend. <laughs> Um, and I did that uh, with Onalaska uh, about a month ago. I'd gotten the list of their students after it was in the paper and sent letters out. And I have never done anything that has gotten more reaction from people. I have folks coming up to me in the store, in restaurants, but all over the place just saying how wonderful it is that we were recognizing good things in, in kids. And so got the list from uh, West Salem and also from Holman. <clears throat> and those letters hit this weekend. So um, it just really makes me feel good to see how many kids are out there that are just really doing well in school. But the other thing that my office noticed is that <coughs> nobody is named Joe or Mary or John anymore. <laughs> um, it just Correct. makes me really feel old. So anyway, that was, that was a really fun thing. What I'm going to do very briefly is different than what I normally do, giving you an overview. Uh, I'm going to give you a bing, bing, bing checklist because we finished our um, floor period, uh, our winter floor period last Thursday, actually Friday morning, um, and we are theoretically done for the year unless we get called back in and for one day in March, which may or may not happen. Um, it's not clear in, in that regard. So I can give you a rundown very quickly of the bills that I know that you've been following and tell you whether they're alive or dead. So hold on, write fast, and if you have any questions, we'll come back and I'll give you um, an update on them. So AB 751, which is the voucher bill that was up last week, got a lot of attention on that. It came about as a result of uh, Speaker Voss being mad at his school district, Racine, and punishing the rest of the state for, uh, for that. Unfortunately, um, when it comes to um, the treatment of, of those vouchers, um, the uh, provision that passed was that you get 33% credit for first year, 67% per, in the third, second year, and a full 1% uh, one uh, unit in the third year. So you get ripped off for the first couple of years for those voucher students, which is going to cost 
uh, 14 million dollars across the state so and that passed the assembly it's in the Senate we're not sure if it's gonna pass there or not uh, Senate bill 589 concealed carry on school grounds is dead that did not pass either house um, won't be taken up anymore this year Assembly Bill 581 is the experience-based education or experience-based training uh, for teaching in uh, public schools where you can get uh, a license to teach a technical education subject. That has passed both houses and it's on its way to the governor. Um, Assembly Bill 481, Senate Bill 5 or 355, the one that limits when you can schedule a referendum for um, exceeding your limits, um, that bill is dead. It had public hearings in both houses, but neither house actually took a vote in the committee um, uh, on that bill. Assembly Bill 144, um, sorry, Dr. Mueller, you're gonna have to tell your daughter September 1 is not <laughs> changing. Um, that bill is dead. Um, it would have provided that if you had 20% or more of your students um, take in high school taking one or more AP classes, then you could start classes before September 1st. That bill um, did not make it out of either house. <laughs> Assembly Bill 469, the transgender bathroom bill, did not make it out of either house and actually did not make it out of committee either. So that bill is dead. Um, a, a couple things that um, were pretty unanimous um, at the, uh, the full legislative body level, AB 664, which is mental health services in schools. What that does is prohibit DHS from requiring a mental health clinic or a licensed treatment professional to designate a school as a clinic site in order to provide outpatient services. Pass both houses on a voice vote. Uh, Assembly Bill 665. Uh, grants for participating in robotics competition, which I went to at Luther this uh, yesterday, and that was really cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, so this provides grants, and that passed the assembly. Hopefully, that will it passed the assembly. In fact, 95 to three. So hopefully, that'll get um, a favorable uh, vote in the Senate. AB 722, school and school district accountability report. What this does is it requires a school to have an internet site with the DPI accountability report linked to it. No big deal, probably already on um, most school districts' web pages. That passed the assembly, um, probably will pass the Senate too. Uh, AB 734, workforce education pilot program, provides up to $125,000 to do a pilot program. CISA will determine which school ends up getting that. That passed 95 to three. Last one that I want to talk about is my bill that um, those of you who look at my Facebook page see passed um, last, uh, last week. Basically, if I call um, the high school and say there is a bomb in the school, I can be charged with a felony. If I call the high school and say I have an assault weapon and I'm on my way over to shoot everybody in the school, that's disorderly conduct, the lowest level of misdemeanor that we have. My bill makes those two consistent. It, because they're really essentially the same be behavior and if you happen to use the word bomb or not shouldn't change the way that you're treated. That bill came out of an incident in Spooner School District where the police spent 200 hours investigating the, um, the threat only to find out after they were done with the investigation that the most they could charge was disorderly conduct. They were needless to say pretty upset about it. But the thing at the committee level that really got people's attention was when we, you know, you hear in the news this happens in Los Angeles, it happens in New York, you think, well, that's there. Um, the Oconomowoc superintendent came and brought several people with, uh, people with him, including some police officers. Oconomowoc in the last several months has had four of those incidents. This is happening in Wisconsin and, and around the state and around the country. Um, it passed um, on a voice vote very overwhelmingly in, in the assembly. Um, and it's my understanding, talking with Senator Schilling, that it's likely to pass the Senate too. So that's, I'm running out of breath. That's a quick rundown of what's uh, happening and happened in the state legislature. And I'll be happy to answer any questions for you. So if there are any questions, out of respect for time, if you just have questions related to education um, or education bills, um, if you would ask them now. Um, I can do this quickly. I know that some of the, the bills that came up and are, are now called dead, I've also read that in the next time that people get together, those bills might be brought up again. That wouldn't happen till next January. Exactly. Yeah. And so I, I just, I guess I wanted to ask you, um, do you think they will be, what are the odds that like, for example, um, the referendum <coughs> bill will come back up and pass. And what about the bathroom bill? 
Um, the referendum bill, I would say probably like a 100% chance that it would come up. I, mean, I, I would expect it to, whether it will it pass. I don't know that that would change. Okay. The transgender bathroom bill may come up. Um, the leadership in both houses really just didn't want to wade into that issue. Okay. Uh, so I wouldn't expect it to get any further than it did this year. In, in fact, it, it got so much attention that it really diverted attention away from all of the other educational issues that were going on. Um, much to the chagrin, I believe, of, of members of both parties. Okay. Um, and so I think that neither side would like that bill to, to come up in the future. Anybody who's in the legislature, of course, can introduce a bill, but that doesn't mean it's going to go anywhere, and I wouldn't expect it to go anywhere. And then just a quick follow-up question. I know some of these bills, in terms of if you're on a school board, um, superintendents came and talked and um, educators came and talked. Um, Did that make the difference, or was it something else that made the difference? Because I think if that, they come up again. I, I think, think that makes a big difference when people come. You know, like on, on my bill, for example, having law enforcement and school officials there to actually tell the stories was very important, very, very critical. Um, you know, for some of the funding and financing things, I think each party kind of already has an idea what they want to do, um, but. It's not just a matter of having school board members and superintendents and principals come to the committee meetings. It's really important to contact the individual legislators. <clears throat> and that's where, you know, here in La Crosse, you have Senator, Sh or in, in Holman, you have Senator Schilling and myself. We hear from you folks all the time. Um, but do your colleagues around the state get in touch with their elected officials, especially? any school districts that are covered by somebody on the Joint Finance Committee, I mean, those people are critical. Yeah. And so, you know, if, if you know school officials or anybody in those districts, I always encourage people, get a list of members of the Joint Finance Committee and look at your Christmas card list. And if you know anybody who lives in those districts, have them contact those folks because that's what really makes a difference. But on that topic, we have awesome superintendents here. I constantly am outreaching to all of the superintendents when a bill comes up and asking them, what do you think about this? And, and I'm get, always getting really great feedback. That is so valuable to me because I don't understand a lot of this stuff because it's so complex. And I'm glad that you didn't ask me a lot of questions because I wouldn't necessarily be able to answer all of them. Uh, but the superintendents have been wonderful in terms of educating me. So thank you. Just one more quick question. I know this is, I was going to be brief, but this can be brief. I am not sure why sometimes a bill comes up and there is a hearing that is publicized and it's going to happen like in two weeks or whatever. But then sometimes there's a hearing that is the next day. And then sometimes there is no hearing. Can you help me understand? Is there a rule about that? How, how does that? work because it's frustrating for working people who have jobs that maybe would come to those hearings. Well, there's really not a rule. Okay. Um, I mean, there is a rule that says that a bill before it gets um, passed in the first house should have a public hearing at the committee level. Um, something that's passed the Senate doesn't necessarily have a committee <coughs> hearing in the assembly. It may just go straight to the calendar um, okay. you know, for the full, full assembly. When we are earlier in the session and things are running at a normal speed, um, typically we're going to have a, usually a week, sometimes more, um, notice of, of public hearings on bills. When we get in this last minute crunch, I mean, we passed 250 bills last, last week. I mean, they were just, and some of them were introduced like a week earlier. I mean, so nobody had a chance really to digest them. And certainly nobody from outside the Capitol had a chance to look at them and get people together and come to some sort of a, a hearing or anything. Um, you know, it, it's not a good way to run democracy. Um, but tempting as it is to get partisan on that, when the Democrats have been in control, they do the same thing in the last two weeks okay. of the last floor period. It's just everything gets rammed onto the calendar, and it is insane. And that's not a good way to do things, but that's, I think, how it's always been. Thank you. You bet. Anybody else have questions? Um, 
couple of comments and then a question. First off, thank you for all you're doing in, in Madison, and I know I'm supposed to keep it to educational, but I also want to thank you for your vote and letting me cross the railroad tracks to go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have gotten comments from, or, or input from more people on that issue than anything else in the last couple of months. So, very important issue. You did not mention the bill on uh, the WIAA um, for the uh, open um, records. Mm -hmm. Any insight as to, I mean, is that dead? Is that still alive? Is that? I'm trying to remember if that was one of the 250 bills we yeah. voted on last week. I don't uh -huh. think it was. Okay. Um, did anybody see anything? I, I think that that one did not pass. Um, and, and because I don't remember it, I'm thinking that. Okay. That was a big enough one that if it had passed, I would have remembered it. Just, I think I read it didn't pass. Didn't pass, yeah. Was beside. Just, just my comments on that. I, when I first got on the board a lot of years ago, I asked a lot of questions. I've never been a huge fan of the WIAA. I, I'm not, I don't like how they assess tournaments and a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, also, a private institution <clears throat> running sports in a public institution has always been, and I always thought it should fall under the DPI. Um, it was sure. always kind of my thought. I thought that would be more in, in line. But I, I really had a hard time with a, a body, and, and I understand the politics and know what, who was asking for it, uh, asking for open records by an organization that didn't itself practice it. So I just thought that ironic. Point well taken. <laughs> How's that for a good answer? Thank you. Other questions? <clears throat> well, thank you so very much. We really appreciate your coming out. And thank you for inviting me. I, I always love getting back to schools. So. <laughs> Thank you for your Thank time. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to district administrator's report. All right. Um, first um, part I wanted to report on is we had 35 of our juniors take the PSAT um, assessment, and 83% of the students met both benchmarks, um, which included our the reading portion with writing and language arts and the math assessment. While in the state level, 64% met the benchmark and only 48% at the national level. So the Holman High School students that are taking the PSAT are faring very well. Um, and then all of our juniors will take the ACT on March 1st and then the ACT work keys on March 2nd. So um, the high school's been very busy getting ready for those assessments with those students. Um, at our middle school, National History Day, which is a big event in Holman, is coming up on the Thursday, the 25th. So we'll have approximately 45 judges representing the district, the community, and UWL, and they'll meet throughout the morning with the eighth grade students to discuss their projects. Um, and we'll, if it's like past years, we'll have around 500 families um, and community members that um, will join us at the open house from 6 to 8 p.m. that evening. So. Come join us for that if you're available. Um, this past week, we had the Wisconsin School Safety Coordinators Association here, and what they did is they went around and did a safety assessment in each one of our building sites. Um, and this is gonna help guide us with our work um, in updating our comprehensive safety plan. So the plan is to bring a presentation <coughs> with our updated plan um, at an upcoming board meeting, more, more than likely in March. And then the Nutrition Services Department, they're always improving, improving. They're gonna implement another new program um, called NutriSlice. And basically it's a cloud-based system and what they'll do is um, not only do they have the calendars of the lunch and breakfast, but they're gonna have pictures of what it actually looks like and then information about it. So if a student's like, hmm, I wonder if I want to have hot, that hot lunch today or not, they can take a look at it and so on. Um, so parents and students will be able to access all this just by clicking on the website and looking at the information. So that's what I have for you this evening. Are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, then we'll move on to reports and discussion. We have the science self-study. Thanks for joining us tonight. I know you have lots of other things going on, so. Tonight we have Steve Malley from the middle school and Josh Kinsman from the high school. 
Good evening. Um, over the last couple of years, we put together or tried to work on our curriculum, and with the new NGSS uh, standards coming out, we're taking a look at how we can improve science education <coughs> K-12. Um, and I think these the, the next generation science standards are a really good fit for us. For Um, the members here that we have at Mexican Middle School and High School, um, I'll talk about the elementary school in a minute, um, but uh, these people here really helped out a lot during uh, staff development days and some meetings after school through those spring and fall or most of the winter time um, to get through these things the last couple of years. That's why it took, for a while, took a while for us to get through these, but at the time we spent on it, I think um, most of the results and some really good benefits coming from this. Stop self study. Ah, mouse is touchy. I'll just use a clip right. um, We did three, me three, minutes of three methods of study. Uh, did a gap analysis of current curriculum that we have now with uh, that of NGSS. We did an external review by Kevin Anderson for the DPI. And then we did a literature review of the NGSS MSTA hub, which is National Science Teachers Association with. Um, National Next Generation Science Standards. They have a website there that um, has a lot of information that will really help us develop curriculum lessons and so on. No, it's not a, you do it. <laughs> All right. There we go. All right. Um, for the three methods, our gap analysis uh, for the high school, for the middle school here. What we did, we took a look at our current curriculum and what we're covering under life science, physical science, earth science, and then um, engineering and technology, science engineering and technology. And we noticed that through our, what we've covered, what, we, what our curriculum has now, and what is currently assessed is 70% of the life science. <coughs> All of that is in the seventh grade area, um, some in sixth, very little in eighth. Um, what is not assessed are 10 standards of NGSS. So the total um, here, total ass assessed or aligned that we have with the DCI, DCIs are the disciplinary core ideas or the topics or things that we'll be covering and the performance expectations, if you take a look, are what we assess them on. And so we look at the performance expectations, what we want to assess, and then we look at the three, three bands, three pillars, or, or, the, or the framework that helps support that. Our science and educate science and engineering practices, our cross-cutting concepts, and our um, dis disciplinary core ideas. And at this point, for the middle school under life, on total, um, we have 68 percent, almost 70 percent of our current group is aligned already with NGSS, um, and about a third is not. And so those are the things we're taking a look at. And over the course of the last couple of years, uh, the middle school has aligned, which has aligned. Um, but a bit with our course mapping. So our course mapping at the middle school is fairly complete. Um, for Earth and Space Science, uh, almost split 58% to 42%, um, and still, but there's less, um, there's less performance uh, core ideas there, DCI is there to assess. Um, it's a total of 24 as opposed to the other numbers were much higher. In Physical Science, it's a little bit higher there, but we cover a lot more of that with physics in the seventh grade and we inspire a lot in the element in the middle school. So we work through six, seven, eight, and we cover a lot of the physical science in eighth grade as well. And so we have a bigger, uh, a larger percentage there that's currently assessed, and less than that. So um, as for the high school, I mean, Josh, you can speak for this. Sure. Did the work on this one? Yeah. For the high school, um, since we have so many different courses, electives, core cl core classes, and recommended courses. We took our what we consider our five core courses in freshman, sophomore years, our freshman <coughs> biology, chemistry and chemcom, our physics and physical world. So we just use those five core classes, we call them our cores, um, to do our gap analysis. And so our electives weren't really considered or any of the other AP courses. We look at what standards are uh, available to students. So this is just looking at those five classes, uh, which most students uh, take during their careers. Um, in our 
gap analysis here, the life sciences, right now we're currently at hitting 86% or assessing 86% of the life science standard area. Um, we look, our lowest category by far was earth and space science, and that I guess wasn't surprising to us looking at just our five cores. <coughs> Uh, currently, our earth and space science standards are accessed through our elective courses at the high school with geology and astronomy and some environmental science. Um, so we're looking at tying some of those as we look at our recommendations into some of those core classes as well. Our physical science uh, DCIs, we're currently hitting about 85% between those five core classes. So that's our our breakdown at the high school and kind of how we looked at um, the new standards comparing them to those five core classes right now. Um, we sent our self-study to uh, Kevin Anderson at the DPI kind of for a school to visit, but they're all in the same boat we're in pretty much. So there's really nothing there to pull from. So for an excellent reviewer, um, we got, so we got a name, Kevin Anderson at um, DPI. And we shared the self-study with him, and he sent us feedback with questions, areas of improvement, comments, and we put those on a, one of our staff development days. We met um, six twelve, and went through and took his comments, put them on the pages where it would be high school or middle school, and just put those in there so we could all work with them. So when we split up, we had our direction to go to fill in the gaps, answer the questions, uh, find our strengths, find our weaknesses. So we did for that, and then worked off of those. Um, what he was concerned about and what I was bringing up now here is there's no current progression from K-12. Um, it's really hit and miss at the elementary level um, and that's a concern for us because we want to make sure that we're not starting science brand new with some kids in sixth grade. And we, need, and then we understand the Common Core and with math and reading and writing are important. Um, but we also need to understand the basic concepts of science and how they can have that critical thinking all the way through there. If you go to the NGSS Hub website and or go to the NGSS website, you can go on the um, the framework and take a look at the the NGSS. And on the bottom of the strands that you have the supportive parts of that, there are direct connections to the Common Core reading, writing, and math. And in those areas of performance expectation, what we assess and the DCIs, you'll notice that there's certain specific um, common core things that we can address in writing, reading, and math. Those standards are, we can address those or are hit in those areas as we, as we teach those and assess for those performance expectations. Um, so there is a way to do that. I'd like to have a conversation uh, with elementary and, and get on some cohesive process. I'm not saying they do it every single day for that, but I just need to have more congruent. Um, when they come into middle school, they should have all this by fifth grade or whatever, so they have some working knowledge, some background knowledge that they can enter and be successful in the science program at the middle school and on the high school. Um, from the literature review, um, there's a plethora of information there. Um, professional development from Latation, um, understanding the science framework, understanding the NGSS, um, how to implement the standards, lesson planning, curriculum development. Um, there's books, resources, webinars, um, tools that we can use, everything from to advanced classes all the way down to um, kindergarten and elementary level. So it's all there. Um, and then NGSS just updated their website with your access for parents, community members, teachers to go through and look at those things and, and get a better understanding of what's happening with those. Um, so, and the resources are there as well to support Common Core, reading, writing, and math. Um, for addition initiatives, um, student achievement and learning, um, we're implementing um, NGSS to guide our curriculum. We're taking a look at those, and they fit. Um, we look at our course mapping in the last couple of years before we started this and to see that well this is where we think it fits and where it's going and so, so I know sixth grade is really taking lessons and breaking that down and using that we use certain topics at the eighth grade level so as we meet for early release they'll see time we're digging into that a little bit deeper starting less by less than a unit by unit and see what's going with that. 
for science high school yeah at the at the high school level um, we recommended taking a look at our our core classes that we're studying for a gap analysis and see where we can tie in a lot more of those earth and space science standards uh, into those five core classes uh, to fill those gaps a little bit more so more students have access to them um, we also really value the fact that students have a choice on their their pathways not only for interest but also career readiness at the high school so that's something that we really wanted to maintain talking to students and parents that's something that they valued as well um, so that's something we want to continue uh, going forward <clears throat> Second initiative in communication, um, we use the Google platform, um, Google, um, Google Classroom quite a bit, um, email, the campus, newsletter, for all the basic things there. Now with the new website coming out, I would put that in this spot too for parents, anybody in the community who wants to go there and know what it's about, why we're doing it, what's behind the NGSS, ask questions to people who developed it. So it's, it's open up there to educate the people on what's happening, what we're doing in the classroom, we're developing the curriculum. We might even see a whole lot of change in our curriculum. We just, it's a lot of it's how to teach, and not so much how to teach, but how to take a look at <coughs> doing science differently a little bit, depending on what some use, some people have to change their paradigm a little bit. But you're not going to see a whole lot of difference in what's happening. If you walk into a classroom, you're not going to see a drastic change. <coughs> Fiscal sustainability, um, currently we share numerous pieces of equipment for the middle school and anyway we know we go back and forth between 6th, 7th, and 8th grade and different pieces <coughs> of equipment, um, utilize information, we share a lot in the PLC time that we have on early release days. Um, there's certain things that consumables are expensive and lab equipment and science is not a cheap subject but to do it right you need to have the right supplies to have that inquiry. A lot of it's going to technology with probes and data collection and things like that where we can have more access to graphing and things and implement some of the math concepts in there as well. Um, and like you have the same thing at the high school. Yeah, similar ways, just trying to make sure that we're using the money in appropriate ways and trying to share supplies as much, communicating with each other. So stuff that we are using is, is shared and we're not having multiple teachers buying the same type of equipment that, that can be shared across one wing to another at the high school. Uh, improved capacity and performance excellence, uh, assessing common, set, uh, using common assessment of data, or slow data, PLCs. Um, early release is very helpful this for 6-8, taking a look at what they're doing there, what we can improve, especially the new curriculum for spiraling at the middle school level. Uh, we can know what the kids know, what they don't know, where we can fill the gaps in the next grade level in this area, uh, what's introduced, what's improved upon. Um, and so that data is always being collected, drive instruction. And so with this, you can see it's going to have some growing pains as we develop the new curriculum, but it's flexible. It needs to be fluid that way so we can adjust. Like the same thing at the high school level. Yeah, more. We, we also talked about the professional development end of things and seeing what other schools and districts are doing and having more opportunities to go out there and communicate and network. Um, it seems like there hasn't been a lot of opportunities to do that in the last few years. It's kind of been stick to your own classroom or go out and watch this video, go online and visit, but to, to go out and visit other schools, see what they're doing is, is pretty valuable. That's it. Are there any questions? Well, I, I do. I have a question. So you mentioned earlier in your um, comments and the DPI, the comments from... Um, Kevin Anderson. Yes, Mr. Anderson from DPI. And I was curious why then um, your initiatives didn't include something from that K to 6 that we're missing in the slide. Um, I didn't want to focus on on that so much. We knew what the gap was there. We know it's there. And I know I'm going to work with Wendy to talk about that and try to get more of the elementary online as I get comfortable with math and, co and common core. 
Um, and we, we know it's there, it's a gap. And I didn't want to bring that up. I wanted to focus on what we were able to do. What we can do is 612. And then bring that on board later. All right, great. Any other questions? What is the elementary curriculum? What What well, is the science curriculum? It's, it's the same that you always have, but. Which is what? They've been using the FOSS program. Okay. But with, and that gets expensive to replace those kits. They get expensive replacing those kits. So then what and happens so if. It's up, it all depends on what they're doing at the school. I could talk to some teachers and they do science on a regular basis. Some don't. School by school, teacher by teacher. It's just, it's not standardized. It's not across that way. So, so to replace the FOSS kit is expensive. Well, what, Can, are, are we affording it as a district? I don't know. Or I, that part, you, I, don't, I, don't, sure. I don't know on that one. You, What's going on? Oh. You want to address that, Wendy? I'm not yeah. sure. Um, mm -hmm. <coughs> It'd be easier to talk into this than bending over. So um, to answer your question, they use the FOSS kits to implement the science written curriculum, which is aligned to the Wisconsin Model Academic Standards for Science, not the NGSS standards. So that is really where the difference is. And um, because educators, I think, have been very focused on math and ELA, they their plates have been full because, you know, they teach all the content areas and they just are still learning more about teaching those with the changes in the standards. So will we get to that in science? Most definitely. But when the committee started doing the self-study, there weren't enough elementary teachers to do the complete self-study for elementary. I have a comment. I just the one thing that stuck out to me was that there's not like consistency amongst the elementaries. So I mean, I know that that's something as a district we're trying to do is provide consistency, you know, throughout the different sites for what kids are receiving. I'm just wondering what the plan might be to ensure that we have consistency that each site's getting equal access to information. So again, I mean, Everyone should be implementing the written curriculum. I just think time is an issue, you know, having enough time to get everything in. You know, when I spoke, speak to most elementary teachers, they say they are teaching science, but, you know, I'm not in everybody's classroom to check that out. I know we've always said that we have site-based building kind of directed things, but curriculum across the district would be standard. It wouldn't be, right. shouldn't matter which elementary school. Correct. They're, 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 they're teaching it. It's just that some teach it here and just hit it a few times here and over here. So, so, and so they're getting it, but they're not getting it on a, on a consistent level like every day at two o'clock in science or, or every other day or something on that line. It's, so it's. Is there a standard of like how much time they, that is required out of a? a DPI does have minimum minutes <coughs> that they do require and that changes per grade level, okay. you know, for like first through third grade. And I may be wrong on this. I think it's 20 to 30 minutes a day where when you're in fifth grade, fourth and fifth grade, it does go up to, I think, 40 minutes, so. And that varies between two. So I'm not, I don't know if they have it, and I'm not saying that. I'm just. Does, does our science committee and, and also all the teachers in their PLCs, I understand, Wendy, exactly what you're saying. Time is, has such limits because lately, I'll just say in the past, like, what, five to eight years, we have put more effort into reading, education, writing, and math. And what that gets down to is it has to take away from something, which is often science and often social studies. And it's not like our teachers don't want to put as much time in there. But then you also have the state testing, 
that doesn't put as much effort into testing results, which are math and reading. And yet we understand as a country and as a state, science is incredibly crucial. So with that question, this isn't a question of blame in any, <laughs> any reason, but do you see how that will change? Do you, do you think it will change? That we can get as much guaranteed for our kids, not just in Holman, but across Wisconsin, um, for science minutes per day? I would definitely hope so, and you know, I think that is a goal, but I, like you said, I mean, we implemented something new. We went through the entire curriculum right, right. process for ELA and for math in the last five years, and they have been implementing new resources in that area. Our elementary teachers are teaching like their hair is on fire. It's not that they don't want to teach science, and it's not that they're not teaching science because they are. It's just, you know, to add one more thing to that very full plate to be on the self-study in the last year and a half, they just haven't had time. I think when you tried to put the committee together, there was only one third grade science volunteer, third grade teacher that was able to volunteer and she definitely couldn't have written all the curriculum for all the grade well, levels. I, I guess I'll be curious to see in the next like five years how that does change because that balance needs to be maintained and definitely Steve and I think both of you um, and Josh because I know your heart is in science and that's an incredible piece for the kids of the future um, and I know we'll figure it out but I'll, I'll, I'll just be anxious to see what that will look like in five years from now. Sure. So that is the self-study piece, correct? And so I think you will be coming back then with the next part is the writing of the curriculum and um, any changes, major changes there. So thank you so much for your time and for your work on this. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to boys hockey co-op renewal. Good evening. Um, I'm Mark Englerth and I'm the Activities Director for the District and I am here to uh, ask for approval to renew our co-op program for boys hockey. Uh, in the past our boys hockey program has been comprised of uh, Aquinas High School and uh, Holman High School of course and Gay Electric Trempolo High School. But uh, a change is being made to this year to include Onalaska Luther High School as well. They have a couple skaters that are looking to get involved and we've opened up our co-op to them. So we're, we'll have a four team co-op uh, in this next renewal process. Um, the expense of this uh, program, I, what the, the district contributes is equal to the same as a head varsity a coaching contract with the addition of an assistant coaching contract and we add those two amounts together and split that between the boys and girls co-op programs to help fund these programs. Okay, any questions? And is this on the consent agenda? I don't think so. For next. For next meeting for next it will time, be. Yeah. Yep. So if you have any questions between now and um, the next meeting, please feel free to let Dr. Mueller know so she can get in touch. Right. Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And then the next item is the uh, preliminary budget, Julie Holman. Good evening. I am not projecting anything tonight because the board has tasked me with two preliminary budgets this year, and that's kind of hard to put side by side up on the screen. Those were provided in the Dropbox um, with the agenda. 
The development of the 1617 budget includes the budget input variables that were assembled and presented to the board on November 23rd, 2015. On December, December 14th, the board approved two different base wage input variables um, to be used in the forecast model. Um, the, uh, the input variables were also reposted to the Dropbox just um, so that you guys could reference that in advance of this meeting. Hopefully you had a chance to look at those and refresh your memory from November. I'm gonna talk through a few um, changes or highlights. Um, they're in the input variables, but I just wanna bring those larger dollar amount items to your attention. Um, first is the addition of the 335,000 in both revenue and expenditures in the general fund. Um, and that is in accordance with the facilities and transportation referendum that was approved April of 2015. Um, $175 for facilities and $160 for transportation. Um, that is to begin the 16-17 school year and it is a recurring referendum. Next um, is the continuation of both revenue and expenditures for the technology referendum. That referendum is $655,000 in the um, general fund operating and that is for four years ending in 2018 and 19. Next is the addition of 250,000 in a one-time general fund facilities expenditure to replace the high school gymnasium. Um, this is due to the premature um, aging of the floor and this project was approved by the board at the February 8th board meeting. The source of the project, the uh, funds for this project because it's earlier <coughs> than we were anticipating will be through the general fund fund balance um, and then repaid through the capital maintenance budget in the following two years. Next is the two base wage input variables that were approved in December. We used, um, in the five-year forecast model, scenario one, we used a 0.25% increasing half a percent for the next four years. And in scenario two, we used 1.5% on base wages for each of the five years. Those two base wage input variables have, present, um, have provided two different preliminary budgets um, for you to review. I will talk a little bit more about the base wage input variables, but I have one other important highlight um, that is included in both budgets, and that is the per pupil categorical aid that's increasing from 150 per pupil to 250 per pupil in the 16-17 school year. The base wage input variables impact the expenditure budgets for funds 10, 27, and 50. Those are the general fund, special education fund, and the food service fund. And then um, the corresponding impact on benefits, so any of the benefits that are percentage of wage, such as Social Security, Medicare, um, LTD, and the Wisconsin Retirement System are all a percentage of wage. So those benefits are impacted by the um, different changes in the base wage increases. The preliminary budget, uh, scenario one I'm calling it, and there's its title on top of your um, Dropbox document, um, has the 0.25% increase in the budget for 1617. And that budget um, has a general fund surplus, revenue exceeding expenditures, increasing the fund balance by $426,000. Um, it is an increase in fund balance from the estimated June 30th, 2016 balance of $10,232,000 to an estimated June 30th, 2017 balance of $10,658,000. This is approximately 23.5% of expenditures. The second scenario that was provided um, the title is wrong on it. We did use 1.5%, but I keyed in 1.25. That'll be replaced in your Dropbox, but just so you know, the percentage applied in the model in the forecasting was 1.5, according to the board approval in December. So the preliminary budget scenario two at 1.5% base wage increase has a projected general fund budget surplus of $65,000 increasing fund balance from the estimated June 30th, 2016 balance of $10,232,000 to 
to an estimated June 30th, 2017 balance of 10,298,000. This is 22.5% of the estimated expenditures. In 2011, the board approved an upper limit for general fund balance as a percent of, a, uh, of expenditures of 23.21%. Um, if you reference the annual report that is produced each year, you, you will see the upper and lower limit of fund balance. Um, administration is in the process of recalibrating and making recommendation for an increase in the general fund balance upper limit. The primary purpose for recommendation will be to support operating cash flow needs internally rather than having to borrow from an outside lender and pay interest costs. The Finance Committee has begun reviewing cash flow projections both last month and tonight. We spent an hour on that tonight just looking at cash flow projections and how to meet those needs internally rather than having to borrow um, like a line of credit at the bank and pay interest. Um, and with um, that study and those projections, we're going to need to set a higher fund balance goal. Um, that work is underway right now to recalibrate that upper limit, to raise it from 23.1% in order to meet internal cash flow needs without going externally. Um, the scenario two preliminary budget with the 1.5% base wage input variable um, and the five-year forecast using 1.5% will present some challenges in the board's ability to increase fund balance to meet cash flow needs. Basically, the higher the wages, the less ability to reserve more in fund balance to meet cash flow. Um, the CPIU for July 1st, 2016 has been posted and it is 0.12%. This is the rate that is applicable to bargaining. When we presented the input variables in November, we were projecting it might come in at about 0.13%, um, which is why we originally used a low input variable for wages of just a quarter percent. The input variable estimates are a starting point. The preliminary budgets um, in DPI format were presented um, and according to our budget development calendar. The projected budget balances are further detailed in the two separate 2016-17 preliminary budgets in DPI format. Um, the document with scenario two or 1.5% again will be reposted with the correct title at the top. Right now it says one and a quarter percent. Are there any questions? Questions? So I have a question about the raising the upper limit. Is there, you know, when we set that standard before we set it with those, the idea in mind, and it's a percent, it's not a number, but it's a percent that that would be an adequate high level number. And you know, in a time when we are looking for dollars, it would be nice to put 426000 into our cash fund. But if we do that, at what expense are we doing that? You know, I look at that, I think, okay, so at what expense? It would be the compensation and benefits expense of being able to give folks even a you know, 1.2 or 1.50, the people that work for us. And when we look at what we often say as a district, <clears throat> we believe our best resources are employees, you know, to me that just, so unless something is saying, unless there is some literature there that maybe you can share with me that says, because we've already hit the, tw you know, the 23.1, but oops, now we need to raise it. I just don't know why, you know, if we're just raising it to raise it or. No, it's, it's a matter of meeting cash flow needs. So um, we're studying the ups and downs of when we receive our aid and levy and trying to avoid borrowing externally. Um, if you recall, one of the strategies Holman has used has been to to use some debt defeasance, and we have raised the fund balance within the debt service levy, or debt service um, account. And in the past, for cash flow needs, we have borrowed internally from ourselves. With the referendum that passed last April, 
um, we did that without increasing taxes. Um, and the way that that was structured was that we would under levy in debt service in order to levy in the general fund and meet, um, still meet our obligation for principal and interest due, but be able to levy for technology purposes without increasing taxes. That reduced our ability and our balance in debt service to borrow internally. And so it's kind of the savings account that we used to use internally is lower. Um, and our expenditure budgets are growing, so the percentage of the new higher expenditure budget doesn't give us as much cash in the bank to meet the cash flow needs when we're waiting for aid from the state. So for, since 2011, the expenditure budget in the general fund has definitely increased, but the percent for fund balance has stayed the same. So a percent of total is a lower amount. And did we have to borrow last year? We borrowed from ourselves. But did but we did not, not do the outside. We did borrow. not go externally. No. No. Other questions? Well, I have one more question. So related to the floor, it, you know, under both scenarios we have either four hundred and twenty six thousand going into our fund balance or sixty five thousand going into our fund balance. But if we were to end the year better than that, either of those scenarios. Is it possible to use those dollars in excess to offset that floor, the cost of the floor, um, the 250,000, I think, I, you know, I just would hate to get to the end of the year and say, oh, well, we have 500,000 that we could put in the fund balance or 100,000, <coughs> you know, is it possible at this point to, as a board to say any excess that we have at the end couldn't it be applied to that so it's not such a big burden from the maintenance department to have to pay that full 250 back maybe they only have to pay 200 back or something in the next year and it could be applied that way um, it similar to funding the un, un and underfunded needs we could use projected um, underspent budget dollars and apply it toward the one-time project so that there isn't a two-year payback uh, reduction, basically, in the maintenance and facilities budget. I just know yeah. we have so many needs there that if we could find a way, after what after we set and establish a budget, if there's some way then to say, this is what's intended to do with any of the additional, you know, surplus or whatever. So, okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. And this is not on tonight's agenda, correct? This I don't believe it's statutorily required that the board approve a preliminary budget. Um, it does, it can go on the consent for next month. I guess we would need some direction as to which one is on consent, unless it is both of them. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. And then we are on to item number 11, the consent agenda, and we have nine items this evening. Um, unless a board member would like to have one pulled and considered separately? Yes. Are you saying yes, you would? Too? Yes, I would. I would like 11.9 A, B, and C all pulled separately. Okay, 11.9 A, B, and C pulled separately. Any others that you would like to have pulled separately? Okay, and then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items 11.1 through 11.8. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <coughs> Motion carries. Then um, item 11.9, employee handbook language revisions. Do I have a motion to approve 11.9 A, B, and C? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. And then discussion. Mr. Menninger, yeah, the, did you have discussion? I, I did. I, depending on kind of how the first part of the conversation goes, in the past when we have had these employee handbooks, and those of you who have known that I've been a big, big process person in the past, um, or Melissa has always come and always presented these to us. We always had an opportunity to review and discuss, and then we took action on them at the next meeting. These are 
just coming to us tonight, I don't recall Melissa over the last couple of meetings um, presenting these to us. Um, I think we talked about the first aid CPR. Well, I think the first aid and CPR, the change and there is And there was a change again because they wanted to add another one to it. We'd already passed it and then they wanted yeah. to add another mm -hmm. to it now. And then I know the um, school calendar um, is, is a change there as well. And with that, I had some additional questions. Well, I only have a professional hours work. Is that the calendar? Is that the Well, it's, yeah. it's yeah. It's, okay. It's, okay. it's the language change to the new student calendar. Mm -hmm. And as I look at that, we're, we're cutting the number of student days from 180 to 178, um, which again is kind of a big philosophical change to not have these presented to us as a board. And, and my question is, is, is there a cost savings with this? Because now we're not going to need the support staff on those two additional days. So are we affecting the compensation for our bus drivers, our, our educational assistants, our, our um, food service personnel and are we by this you know creating a, a you know a, a reduction in wages to a, an entire group of of colleagues or employees correct we brought the student calendar forward earlier which had this piece as a part of it mm -hmm. in that and um, the discussion of that did not come up at that time so what we've been doing is we've been working closely um, with all of our different groups on what the employee calendars for these different groups would look like um, we had discussion at our employee relations team meeting and then took their feedback and then um, so your question as far as cost savings there will be some cost savings um, the calendars were actually shared with each of the different groups um, at our early release time here in February um, February 10th thank you um, about the changes and so forth um, one thing we did is we reviewed and made sure the one piece that the concern was is would someone be losing their health benefits because that is based on for our support services groups it's based on the amount of hours of work so we, <coughs> we reviewed that and um, checked over who, who which employees that would affect and made sure that we um, were able to honor that there would not be um, a change in effect for those employees um, I guess as far as the food service group um, the way we looked at this was there will not be students to serve for those two days so then there's no reason for them to be there for these two days kind of like bus drivers there's no students mm -hmm. to drive so there's no um, reason for bus drivers to be here but a lot of times um, the way we do professional development staff development for these groups is on a um, as needed basis and the supervisor will have them come in and pay them extra hours for those pieces um, so there was discussion that when that's needed they would get those extra hours still for that time now as far as the teacher group and the educational assistant group and our um, secretaries that are year-round they their contracts all will stay the same because of the professional development they're getting and the reasoning behind this is the focus on the student achievement and professional development and preparing for these students in that and when they're coming if that makes sense so i don't know if and have we had approved the new calendar the student calendar we have approved and yeah. i think so isn't what this doing is related to what we the approved approval, in the, yes. the student calendar then mm -hmm. it's it, and i i support the the seven staff <laughs> development days I mean I, I I think that's wonderful I think that there's great value there I, I'm looking at this going in you know, especially coming from the guy who talks about year-round school should we keep the 180 days have seven staff development days and that's probably going to cost us more money because we're going to have to pay for that because those are extra days but if we get value from it <clears throat> I'd be willing to even look at that versus you know here where I think we're taking hours from our support staff and reducing the number of student days which is is
kind of a, a double, double um, negative for me. I know that there's a motion and a second. I, I, I do not plan to support these for a couple reasons. Number one, I voted no on the CPR thing the first time it came around, so I'm going to be consistent. Um, number two, I think, again, because of process, I, I really would have preferred these come to us like all the other handbook revisions had, and then with a vote at a second meeting so we could have had this as a discussion. I, I also am a little hesitant for the reasons I expressed um, here. Um, I think we're... we're um, cutting back some wages for some of the support staff. And so obviously for those three reasons, um, I will be voting no on these 11-9 um, <coughs> Any items. other comments? A motion has been made and seconded to approve 11.9 A, B, and C. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Nay. And motion uh, passes. Board member reports and discussion. <coughs> Um, usually I call on board members to report on some things, but I just wanted to start this evening with a, a, a statement or a couple comments. Um, I just wanted to begin by offering condolences to the Romanowski family on behalf of the board of directors. Please know that our hearts ache for you and your family. The loss of any child is a tragedy. In Holman, we work very hard to ensure that every student matters. Please keep Kevin's family in your thoughts and prayers at this, this difficult time. If you have not hugged your child yet today, hug them. If you have, hug them again, no matter what age. So then I will call on the rest of the board members if you have any committee reports, um, any um, comments that you'd like to make, please share them at this time. Kate Mayer. No, um, everything that you see from um, SALC is is standard updating very simple thank you Lisa Collins um, we had a finance committee meeting this evening prior to the board meeting and um, just went over group two of our um, policy reviews just on budget adoption procedure and public uh, budget publication and dissemination and I think just more talk about cash flow and how to um, resolve some of those peaks and valleys and you know um, helping the public to kind of understand some of that and how we can um, make more of an even, even flow with it as we go throughout the budget cycle. That's about it. Thank you. Mr. Menninger. Uh, no real committee reports. Just uh, again thank Representative Doyle for taking time out of his schedule to come visit with us tonight. Um, certainly those people who presented us and would like to thank the board for their continuing to listen to me when I uh, kind of look at things from a different point of view. So thanks to the board as well. Thank you. Mr. Dunlap? We, we kind of expected. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to miss that about you, Tim. <laughs> I too would like to uh, offer my sincere condolences to the Romanowski family. I have a sophomore grandson and it uh, struck uh, really close to home. I can't help but feel as a community we uh, somehow failed this family. And as a community, I think we have to be mindful of these, of these vulnerable kids and give them maximum effort to prevent things like this from happening. That's all I have. Uh, Mr. Cruz. Yeah, I wanted to thank the FFA organization. I think this is a great organization. It's just uh, they always do a really nice presentation, and I love their marketing um, with their pens. And I... I um, agree with Gary 100% and I am praying for the Romanowski family and uh, may they find grace and hope in the future and may our district continue to learn from things too. Thanks. Mr. Young, Jeff? Uh, I have a few things. Uh, I give my condolences to Kevin because I knew him real well and it's kind of sad. But other than that, uh, Today, students released balloons into the sky for Kevin. Uh, we wrote messages to him. And uh, next week is the ACT, so uh, the juniors, that's a great opportunity uh, to start and make sure, because uh, they are important and they're free, which is also important. So, uh, if you don't want to take it again, then I would suggest that this is not a joke and you should take it. 
Um, winter sports is wrapping up, and uh, uh, show choir performed for the high school on Friday, and that was happy. And then I just um, had a comment about the election. Congratulations to those who um, are advancing. And a thank you to Lisa Kozen for putting your name out there. I know it's difficult. I've lost my share of elections. I know that's not easy. Um, but I do appreciate her willingness to put her name out there later on. We will be drawing um, for the order of the, the ballot for the remaining. And, and good luck to everyone um, in April. Um, Let's see, board committee minutes. You received finance, student achievement, buildings and grounds, and personnel and governance minutes. Um, we meet March 14th and March 28th for regular board meetings. And um, Kate, did you want to report on the election results specifics? Did you have specifics? No, I don't have. Oh, specifics, it's in mine. But we're gonna pull ballots. So we are gonna pull the ballots. Yeah. Yes, I would. I'll report. I'm sorry. Um, That's all right. Lisa Collins had 657 votes. Thomas Lyons had 471. Richard Hayden ha had 569. And Rebecca Reber 559. And so those are the four that will advance. And Lisa Cozen had 344. And so I think now is the time we do the drawing. And so we'll let Kate. Ready? Sure. I'll First draw. person on the ballot will be. And you can read. Rebecca Reber. Okay. You tell me when you're ready for the second. Mm -hmm. I'm good. You're good. Lisa Collins is number two. <clears throat> Thomas Lyons, number three. <laughs> Rick Hyden, number four. Hey. And then, um, let's see. Board policies, this SALC weapons in schools. Anything on that, Kate or Wendy or Julie? That, Or is it just a regular for review? It's, com it's coming up. OK. That's all that okay. you need to know. That's We'll be talking about it, and then we'll bring back a recommendation. And then under school board evaluation, I think that in your place, everyone has this right, there is a um, opportunity for you to go to the website, to this website and enter this access code and to do um, a survey it would be on our school district, on our school board, and we are looking, we're working with the um, WASB to do that and to get some results. So if you would do that in the next couple of weeks, then we would um, have a board evaluation information to share with you. So there you go. And then it is time to move on to executive session. Kate, would you read the motion for executive session? Absolutely. Be it resolved that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851C for the purpose of considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. In this case, the impact of federal minimum wage rate for exempt employee and base wage negotiations. Is there a second? Second. And then if you would do the roll call. Kate Meir? Yep. Lisa Collins? <coughs> yes. Mr. Mettinger? Yes. Mr. Dunlap? Yes. Mr. Cruz? Yes. Mrs. Hancock? Yes. And Mrs. Jagosinski is excused, right? So we will come back in about three or four minutes.